Chapter 3, World Record for the Most Altercations. What do they call criminal records? Not criminal records, they call them something else. Rap sheets, yeah, that's it, rap sheets. Which is such a dumb name, because it makes me think of rap music. Like, maybe a rap sheet is what rappers write their rhymes on. But yeah, rap sheets. I got one of those. Not a real one, though. One that r real criminals have. Nah, I got a school rap sheet. But in school, they call it a file. I got a file. And even though I've never actually seen it, it has to be pretty big. Because I'm always being sent down to the principal's office, or put in detention, or suspended for shutting down people's smack talk. Oh, Castle, why are your clothes so big? Why are your pants so small? Why are your name ca Castle? Why do you always smell like you walk around? You walked over a thousand miles to get here. Why it looked like somebody tried to cut your hair with a butter knife? And my response would be, well, let's just say, Let's just use the schooly terms, not exemplary behavior. But I'd made a decision that there'd be no more entries added to the file. The file would be closed forever because now my new career track, which was really my soon to be career in basketball, was at stake. All of a sudden, I had too much on the line. There would be no more altercations. That's the word Principal Marshall always used on the phone with my mother, altercations. And I was altercation free for 17 hours and two minutes. Two of those hours spent watching one of those corny, romantic, mushy, mushy movies with my mom. She loves those things. And every night when we're eating dinner, she sits on our couch in the living room and watches one while opening mail and clipping coupons. I always spread all my blankets out on the floor, three or four to make what Ma calls a pallet, which is where I eventually doze off. She takes the couch. We haven't slept in our rooms since Dad too weird for her to try to sleep in the room they slept in. And I got this thing about being so as close to the door as possible, just in case we have to get up and run again. Plus, now that I've gotten older, I just want to make sure I'm near her in case I got to protect her. So yeah, that was two hours, 9 p.m. Then I was asleep for 10 hours. I'm grumpy when I don't get at least eight. Some people would say I'm grumpy even when I do, but they don't know nothing. 7 a.m. Snooze, 7.05 a.m. Snooze, 7.10 a.m. Because get your butt up for school. I'm not playing. 7.20 a.m. Lay there looking around the living room, up at the light in the ceiling. The glass thing that covers the bulb has dead bugs in it. Under the couch, there are toys that I don't even remember playing with. Look at the pictures on the wall. Me at 9 and at 8 and at 7 when Ma was experimenting with giving me a mohawk. But no pictures of the family. Then, finally, it was time to get up. 8 a.m. 10 minutes spent in the shower, 10 minutes getting dressed, and 10 minutes eating breakfast. Toast with peanut butter and honey, 8.30 a.m. 17 minutes walking to school, 8.47 a.m. Homeroom dismissed, 9.10 a.m. 45 minutes in English class, where we were reading Lord of the Flies, which, by the way, is a crazy book, 10 a.m. Then 45 minutes in math class which was basically 45 minutes of Maureen Thorne raising her hand every single time Mr. Granger asked a question so that she could go up to the board and write the answer. Such a show-off. She's like the geeky girl version of Lou. So yeah, that happened, 10.50 a.m. And then there was social studies class, which I usually call nap time because we never study nothing. Like, I don't know, social media or social events like parties. All social studies is, is a stupid way to say history. It's like the rap sheet of history, or something like that. Anyway, I would usually snooze through it, but it was a, day, a new day, and I was turning over a new leaf, so I stayed awake. Didn't really focus too much on nothing being said, but my eyes were wide open. 11.40 a.m. And then lunch. You know who ate lunch at the same time I did. Brandon Simmons. Jack, from Lord of the Flies. A power-hungry dummy, and the single most annoying dude in the seventh grade. He owned that record. A record that's really hard to be owned. Because there are a lot of annoying dummies in the seventh grade. Trust me, I know, but none like him. Brandon was a year older than everybody because he stayed back a year. Dude was dumb as dirt, and that wouldn't have been bad if it, he wasn't at least cool, but he wasn't. Plus, he was taller than most of us, so he treated everybody like chumps, especially me. Just made it to the cafeteria at 11.44 a.m., got in line. Brandon came in after me, bumped me, and then, seeing that I ignored him, decided to step in front of me. Shaq, he said. Shaq was what he called me as his lame way of making fun of the fact that my name is Castle. You don't mind me butting in front of you, right? I mean, 
it's not like you haven't had cafeteria food before. You probably had some last night, right? He shrugged and hit me with another one. Right. The only reason Brandon uh, even knew anything about my mother is that we, when we were back in fourth grade, yes, I've known him that long. My mother thought it would be a good idea to come speak at career day. And Brandon had has used it ever since. He grinned, then looked around to make sure other people had heard him, which was always the most important part of his jerkiness. Then a few more. Right, right. I sat at the table, 11.50 a.m. The same table I sat at every day with my two friends, Dre Anderson and Red Griffin. I met Dre this year, and we hit it off because he's a ball player too. Plays for the Boys and Girls Club, and he told me I should have played, but I missed the tryouts on purpose. Thing is, Boys and Girls Clubs don't ever really cut nobody. Everybody can just sign up and play, but who wants to be on a team with a bunch of pity players? I don't want to bust Dre's bubble because that ain't cool, but for me, I'm too good to play on a team like that. I mean, I don't really know that, but I knew that, you, you know? And Red, well... I've known him for a long time. We've been cool since fifth grade, mainly because even though we've never really talked about nothing bad, we both kind of knew something bad happened to us. Like for me, the best way to describe it is, I got a lot of scream inside, and I could tell Red did too. He was a white boy with red hair who everybody was friends with, mainly because people were scared that he was crazy, and it's better to be on the crazy than good side. Jessica Grant said her mother said, the only reason people have red hair is because they're red on the inside. Red like violet. But I got black hair, so does that mean I'm black on the inside? Anyway, Brandon came and sat, sat next to Red at the table. He usually sat further down by the other gas mouths, but not today. Today he sat right next to Red, and right across from me and Dre. Yo, Red, you ever been to Glass Manor? Brandon asked while chomping on a chicken drummy. Nope, Red said. Dry, just before taking a sip of his juice. He wasn't playing Brandon or mind. Oh man, you should go. It's something to see, Brandon said, now looking right at me. We caught eyes for a second, but then I darted mine to my french fries and ketchup. Dip, then bite. Dip, then bite. Don't look up. Don't pay him no attention. Dip, then bite. Brandon continued. You really get to see where they got my name, Glass Manor, from. Because, dude, everybody who lives around there is a freaking, is freaking shattered. Dre let out a big sigh, like, here we go again, sigh. And Red glanced at me because he knew where I lived. Everybody knew I lived there, and even though I wasn't the only kid from school in that neighborhood, it seemed like I caught the most mess about it, at least from Brandon. Red looked back at Brandon, disgusted, and went on eating. What a dumb joke. Brandon was talking to Monique, who sat next to him, 12.02 p.m. Really, he was snatching food off her plate and teasing her about her acne. The thing was, everybody knew he had a crush on Monique. No matter how many moon-faced jokes he cracked, everybody also knew he tried to get her. But she kept rejecting him, which was the real reason he snapped on her. Her acne wasn't even bad. Hey, sh hey, Shaq, he called out. All you're going to have is fries? Again, I didn't say nothing. I didn't have to explain that I always got fries so I could save a dollar to get sunflower seeds later. So I just ignored him. Just sat there with my empty tray and shook up my chocolate milk. Lunch would be over in a few minutes. A few minutes. I was so close. So close. Then, Brandon grabbed the drummy off Monique's tray. Here, take this. It's my good deed for the day, feeding the hungry, and he threw the chicken wing at me. It hit me in the chest, the greasy instantly staining my t-shirt, and if my insides were really black at that moment, they were definitely turning red. Red and Dre looked at me, both their mouths open in disbelief. I could tell I could tell they could see the anger in my face and my eyes. Dre slid down, and Red got up from the table and moved away from us. I brushed the over-fried wing off my lap, opened my milk carton, took a swig, and then, with all my might, beamed the container at Brandon's head. He moved just in time, and the open milk box smashed into the table behind him. A brown liquid exploded everywhere, and everyone at the table looked around to see what was happening. Brandon sprang from his seat, but before he could even make a move, I picked up my plastic tray and whacked him upside the head. He fell backward. I was I kept coming. I dove across the table, and after that, it was just like it was, it was in sprinting. I didn't hear nothing. Not even Monique squealing, and I didn't feel nothing either. I just lifted my arms, fist tight, and lowered them like hammers down onto Brandon's face. I had been good, so good, altercation free for 17 hours and two freaking minutes. The third, fourth, and fifth minute of the 17 hour were the altercation minutes, but the sixth was the longest minute of them all, the embarrassing walk to the principal's office. Do you want to tell me what happened, or should I tell you? Principal Marshall closed the door behind him and took a seat at his desk arms folded across his chest, 
He waited for me to answer, but I didn't. I just slouched to my chair and stared into my lap, biting on my bottom lip, trying to turn the red inside back to black. I was just so mad, I couldn't get to go outside. Mr. Pierum, or as everybody called him, Big Perm, because of his last name, because he had bone straight, permed hair, is who pulled me off Brandon. He yoked me up in some kind of full Nelson arm lock and practically dragged me to the corner until I calmed down enough for him to let me go. Of course, all the other students were screaming and cheering and all that, like I was putting on some kind of show, another one. But it was never a show for me. It was serious. It was always serious. Next, Perm helped Brandon as he started leading him to the nurse's office. No smack was coming from Brandon's stupid lips. No mom jokes, no poor jokes, no name jokes, none of that. Just blood and ketchup. Still, I said nothing to the principal. I wasn't about to just snitch on myself. Okay, Mr. Crenshaw, let me help tell you what happened, the principal Marshall continued. He leaned forward and rested both hands on his desk, fingers woven. You just got yourself suspended, again. Dang, I didn't even start it. I couldn't resist muttering. What's that? The principal asked with some extra bass in his voice. I lifted my head. I said I didn't start it. Brandon was talking about me. He kept going on me. I tried to keep a stone face, which is hard to do when you're desperately trying to explain yourself about how my mother works in a cafeteria in my neighborhood and all that. He's always trying me, and he didn't even know me like that. Just wouldn't shut up. Marshall leaned back in his seat. So instead of telling a teacher you jumped on him, well, yeah, Brandon needed to beat down as far as I was concerned. Somebody had to, and well, this wasn't the first time. I had been in this kind of altercation. I mean, there was the time I yelled at Mr. Crew because he kept being mean about us not understanding Spanish well enough to speak in perfect accent or whatever. He was just riding us too hard for not rolling our R's, and one day I lost it. After class, everybody told me he deserved it, but I still called him attention for it. And then another time, Damon D.W. Woods told everybody that I kissed this girl named Janie, who was the only pretty girl who liked me, but I hadn't, and I hadn't told D.W. that lie. I just told him that me and Janie exchanged phone numbers. Once she found out, Janie said I was disgusting and stopped talking to me, so I punched Damon in the stomach. He cried and ran to Marshall, and I got suspended for that one. And then Janie liked me again, but I was already over her. And me and Brandon had a bunch of other moments. But it was mostly just a lot of yelling. Really just me yelling and him laughing, but not no more. No more getting the Brandon run around. Then it hit me. Run around? Running. The team. Coach. Make a deal with my mother. I only have one shot. No mess-ups. No do-overs. No altercations. But what was I supposed to do? What would you have done? I asked Mr. Marshall. The tears were teetering in and out, in and out, and I was trying my best to keep them in. You ain't never been pushed before to the point you could just take it. Principal Marshall cocked his head to the side and studied me. Then he hunched forward again and put his face in his palms, as if remembering a time he went through this. Then he wiped his hands down his face like he was washing them, that memory away. I'm going to deal with Brandon, but you, he said. His voice was now a little softer. You got to get it together, Castle. I know you've been through some things, but you just can't keep doing this. He stood up from his desk and came around to the front. I'm not going to give you a full suspension this time, but... You you do have to go home for the rest of the day. He reached behind him for the big black telephone. Here, he held up the phone toward me. Call your mom. Now I knew what the principal marshal was letting me off the hook big time. But there was no way I could call my mother and tell her that I needed her to come get me from school. No way. I hadn't even really been on the track team. And I was already about to be kicked off. I hadn't even been to practice yet. Plus, what was I going to say? That I punched a jerk for trash talking about me? I mean, that was what happened. And as awesome as it sounds, my mother would have hit me with the how many times do I have to tell you to be a bigger person, followed by some crazy punishment that involved me coming to the hospital with her, which was always whack. I can't. I shot back at the principal. You can't what? I can't call her. He looked confused. And why not? I don't know, I said, trying to think of a good reason, a good lie. But nothing came. I just can't. Then it hit me. But I can call my uncle. Your uncle, he said matter-of-factly, like he knew that was impossible. The other thing I should tell you about files is sometimes they have way too much information about you in them. Stuff that don't be nobody's business. And where is this uncle? He's working, but he can come get me. Why haven't I ever heard of this uncle before? He asked suspiciously. He's been gone, I explained, trying to keep a straight face. Looked at him dead in the eye, but he's back now. Yikes. Not really as smooth of an answer. Mr. Marshall just sat there squinting at me, one eye 
slightly more close than the other, tapping his leg. Then he humped and handed me the phone. Call him, he sighed. I unzipped my backpack and dug around for the card that said the defenders, coach, in black block letters. I bowed and waited while it rang. Come on, pick up, come on, pick up, I thought. Please pick it up. Yes, it was coach's voice on the other end of the phone. But he didn't say hello or nothing, so I caught, it caught me off guard. Hello, I said. Who's this? It's me, um, Castle, um, I spoke in a little low into the phone. Ghost, ghost, boy, what are you doing calling me at? He paused, I guess to check the time. At 12.22, ain't you, you in school? Yeah, but I need you to come get me, I said, looking at the principal marshal, who was staring at a hole in my head. I was trying not to say uncle, which was what he was waiting for. I got in trouble. What? Coach said, before I could say anything else. He told me to hold on. 9.75, ma'am. Uh-huh, thank you. Have a good day. Then the sound of the door slamming. Now, what are you talking about, ghost? I got in trouble and they're suspending for the day, so I need you to come and get me. Why are you calling me? Why don't you call your... And before he could even finish the sentence, he answered his own question. Oh, I see, kid. You're already killing me. I glanced up at Principal Marshall again. He was getting angsty and knew I only had a few seconds before he snatched the phone. Turns out I had even less than a few seconds. Give me the phone, Principal Marshall said, getting up and grabbing it from me. Then he aired everything out. Hello, Principal Marshall here. Is this Castle's uncle? I dropped my head and waited to pretty much be body slammed. Uh-huh. Yes. Well, I need him off the premises as soon as possible. Just for the rest of the day. Principal Marshall sat on the edge of the desk, waiting for me to look him in the eye. But I wouldn't. I just looked around the office at all the posters that said stuff like excellence and discipline. He had pictures of past students, probably kids who did excellent things, disciplined things holding ribbons at a science fair, clutching a trophy, some kid giving the camera a thumbs up like a cornball. Probably all good students, not kids like me. Mr. Marshall was a uh, uh, coach. Uh, uh, I see. Okay. Then he handed the phone back to me, but coach had already hung up. Principal Marshall walked back behind his desk and took a seat. What did he say? I asked, bracing for a slam. He said he'll be here in a minute. It would have been the worst mistake ever to smile, but I sure wanted to. I sat there in the office while the principal went on about his business, flipping through folders, looking at something on his computer, scribbling on a notepad. When I finally asked him about the pictures of the different students on the wall, who are those kids? I asked, biting a fingernail. Must have snagged it on the scuffle. Principal Marshall looked up from all his busy work. You don't get to ask me questions until tomorrow, he snapped. His tone was sharp, and I could tell he wasn't playing. I don't want to hear your voice. Your job right now is to sit there and wait for your uncle. Got it? He just nodded and sank myself. Thankfully, it wasn't too long before Coach came marching up the hallway. The look he gave me was just as bad as the look Mr. Marshall had given me, which were like the looks my mom gave me whenever I was in these situations. I'm the I'm so disappointed in you look, which is way worse than the I'm mad look. I'm here to get Castle, Coach said to the secretary. Mrs. Dixon. Okay, just sign him out, she said. Coach scribbled something on a piece of paper, checked his watch, jotted the time down, met the principal, shook his hand, apologized, to him for what I did, and we all went out of there. On the way down the hall, Coach didn't say a thing, not a word, but as soon as we got to his cab, he lit me up. What were you thinking, telling those people I'm your uncle? Do you know that's probably against the law? I'm not sure it is or it isn't, but it probably is. And if it is, you got me out here committing crimes. I've known you for a day, a day, and I just kidnapped you. I kept quiet because Coach was really mad. Plus, I was super grateful that he came and got me. And I didn't want to say anything to mess that up. Shoot, he might have turned around and took me back to school if I said the wrong thing. Then finally, after a few minutes, he calmed down a little and asked, What's happened anyway? I got in a fight. I star stared out the window as we passed Mr. Charles' store. Care to elaborate, Coach Pride? Okay, so there's this dude named Brandon Simmons. He's always getting on me about my mom and where I live and how I look and all that. And today, I just couldn't take it no more. I faced Coach. He glanced at me, then back down the road. So I jumped on him, beat him down. And and what? You think that makes you tough, Coach scoffed? I thought about it for a second. I don't know. Does it make it right? He asked. Doesn't it, does that make it right? He asked. Was it about adults that make them all just say the same thing? Like they all study the same book about grown upness, memorizing phrases like, does that make it right? And be the bigger person. I just shrugged, spoke with my shoulders. I kind of wanted to say, yes, yes, me punching Brandon in the face makes it right, because he had been begging for it forever. 
It just made it right for everybody he joked on. And all those kids would have given me honor roll certificates for what I did. That wasn't the answer Coach was looking for. But man, that's how I felt. Coach drove through town and eventually we ended up at Martin Luther King Park. He said that since I had cost him a half day's worth of fares, the front seat wasn't even all junky yet. I would have to make it up to him by putting in extra work at the track, which was fine with me. Coach grabbed his whistle and clipboard from the glove compartment. Okay, here's how you're spending your suspension. We got three hours before practice. We're going to use this time to get you caught up on the way all this goes. How all what goes? Being on my team, boy. I could tell he was still irritated, but not as much as he had been. We headed over the track, the bright white lines marking out the red lanes, the green field in the middle. Okay, so first things first, where's your practice clothes, coach asked him. These them, I said. You have jeans and high tops, he stated the obvious. I looked at myself. There was a stain on my sneakers, a new one, maybe ketchup or chocolate milk. So, I said, what's wrong with that? Coach sat down on a bench, stretched out his legs. You know what? Don't worry about it. We'll figure that out later. Let's just start with some stretching. Apparently, there were a whole slew of different kinds of stretches. Coach showed me how to do them all. Each one was for a different reason. This one for this part of the leg, that one for that part of the leg, another one for your back, then jumping jacks, toe touches, push-ups. It all seemed silly to me, but not as silly as the next part, the two-lap warm-up jog. Me and Coach bounced around the track, him telling me to keep my arms tucked, which was actually hard to do. He said form is everything when it comes to running, and that that it has more to do with form than how fast your legs move. That didn't sound right. To me, it seemed like if your arms were tucked, but your legs were moving fast, weren't moving fast, then I wasn't going to be beating nobody. Just common sense. But then again, I didn't think a two-lap jog, as slow as we were jogging, would get me going. But by the time we finished, I was pouring sweat. Good, good, he said as we got back to the bench. He bounced around on his toes like a boxer before finally settling down. Feels good, don't it? I wiped my face with my shirt and took a seat. I was tired and energized at the same time, which was weird. I didn't do it to make me feel good. I blurted out of nowhere. Coach stopped bouncing. He sat down next to me and grabbed a towel from his bag. What are you talking about? He asked, wiping sweat from his bald head. More like buffing it off. What, what do you ask me in the car? If beating up Brandon makes me tough, I reminded him. I said that I didn't know, but I do. We locked eyes. The answer is no. It doesn't make me tough. Coach moved the towel from his head to his neck. So what does it make you then? I don't know, but not tough. I thought for a second, but because for something to make you feel tough, you gotta be a little bit scared of it at first. Then you gotta beat it. But I wasn't scared of Brandon at all. He's just a big guy with a mouth, with a big mouth. That ain't really all that scary to me. I've been thinking about this when we were running around the track, warming up. In between Coach's tips about form and all that stuff, my brain was kicking that question around. Let me guess, Coach said now flinging the towel over his shoulder. You're one of those kids who ain't scared of nothing or nobody. Nah, I chuckled just for a second because I knew those kinds of kids Coach was talking about. The kids who say they ain't scared, but they're really scared of everything. Kids like Brandon. He talked all that trash and teased people because he was shook, a cupcake. But that wasn't me. I ain't saying that. I've definitely been scared of something or somebody before. Real scared, I added. Thinking about how loud a gun sounds when it's fired in a small room. That's how come I know how to run so fast. But now the only person I'm scared of, other than my mother, I mean, like, I do things I know ain't cool. But even though I know they ain't cool, like beating on Brandon, all of a sudden I'm doing it. Anyway, you know, you know? So I guess, I guess the only person I'm really scared of, maybe it's me. A grunt seeped from Coach. He rubbed his right knee. I hear you, kid, he said, wincing, stretching out his right leg, bending it, then straightening it. Then he did the same to his left. Trouble is, you can't run away from yourself. Coach snatched the towel from his shoulder, folded it into a perfect square, and then set it in the space between us. Unfortunately, he said, ain't nobody that fast.